you ask people what edge compute is, you get a range of answers. Cloud compute and DevOps with devices and sensors, the semiconductors outside the data center, including connectivity, AI, and a security strategy. It's a stew of technologies that's powering our vehicles, our buildings, our factories, and more. It's also filled with fascinating people that are passionate about their tech, their story, and their world. I'm your host, Pete Bernard, and the Edge Celsior Show makes sense of what edge compute is, who's doing it, and how it can transform your business and you. So let's get started. Okay, awesome. So we are here, and uh, I want to welcome Bill Bubenicek from Generate Capital here into our studios, into your headphones, or into your cars, or wherever you're listening to this. Um, and before we get into Bill's origin story, so just to kind of set the stage here, um, so Bill and I know each other. We've done some work in the past. He is a, he is a resident, as I am, uh, in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, um, although he lives there full time. <laughs> so we can talk about that. But um, Bill's had an interesting background in power, and we were, you know, before we hit the record button, you know, if you look at Brad Smith's um, talk at MWC on AI economy, which I thought was a really good one to go look up, he talked about the um, kind of the foundations of the AI economy, and there's kind of two pieces to the foundation. One is connectivity, and the other is power, and power as in electricity. Um, And so quite often when you get in discussions around edge computing, um, the issue of power, power cost. I mean, certainly there's power discussions when you get into low power systems that are, you know, battery powered. Um, but even, you know, data centers, edge data centers, things like that, there's just this, uh, you know, kind of an existential, I wouldn't say crisis, but, you know, an existential challenge about power. And so, Bill, I want to welcome you to the show to talk about this stuff. Um, why don't you give folks kind of your intro, your origin story, let people know who you are. Sure. Thanks for having me, Pete. Um, yeah, so I started out really in GSM network buildouts, which, in other words, uh, uh, cell cell phone infrastructure, mm-hmm. uh, primarily in emerging markets, is kind of where I started. Um, so I spent a lot of time in Middle East, Africa, parts of Latin America, and uh, while doing those uh, buildouts and selling the equipment there, I came across the cell towers that were in most of those markets running on diesel generators twenty four seven. And it was around 2006, 2007, and we called it clean tech then. Um, mm. But the clean tech thing was kind of happening, and and uh, I got into that, and I was you know, pretty excited about a more sustainable energy future. Mm. And I thought, well, here's a good place to start. I'm <laughs> already, already in the cell tower business, and they're all running on diesel generators 24-7. So what can we Yeesh. do? Yeah. Um, so we implemented some of the first what we called hybrid systems, which is just battery cycling with generator. Eventually that turned mm-hmm. into battery plus solar plus uh, generator. And um, I, I launched a company called Clean Power Systems in 2010, uh, co-founded that, and, and brought those solutions into the African continent, uh, mostly Uganda, uh, Kenya, and Ghana were our primary markets. Um, and then sort of fast forward, I, I got a crash course in project finance when I realized, hey, there might be a better way as, as opposed to selling these things on a CapEx basis, right? Can we sell it mm-hmm. as a soap? And so, you know, I, I don't have a proper sort of finance or analyst background or anything like that. So it was really learning through osmosis. And we launched our next company then that was focused on converting our solutions into a as a service model or like an escrow mm-hmm. model. And so right. we did that in... Uh, East Africa and in India. And um, that was yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of good experience, but mostly an off-grid environment, right? So I, my, my right. power experience started, started kind of, you know, in the off-grid sector or the, I call it poor grid uh, sector, where it was like really intermittent power. Mm-hmm. Um, so a- anyway, you know, got a lot of good experience there. In fact, that's where I first met uh, Jigger Shaw, who's a co-founder of Generate. Um, we tried to do a few deals in Uganda at the time and, and uh, kind of kicked around a lot of ideas. And he had a lot of kind of good advice for me uh, as an entrepreneur trying to, to make it in this space. And um, when I finally came back to the States and was kind of looking at a change, say, like, how do I make 
a much bigger, broader impact, right? Like this was a great business and we, mm -hmm. a lot of lessons learned, but it's really hard operating in these, in these other markets. Yeah. And, um, uh, I came back and I was in Boston at the time and reached out to Jigger, um, amongst others. And he called me back, I think within 30 seconds of the email <laughs> and, uh, and said, Hey, what's your, you know, what's your thesis for, you know, all things related to digital and kind of how that intersects with energy. And I said, well, I got to work on that thesis, right? It's been a while. I've, I've got the off grid side, but let me, let me have a look. And, and, uh, he kind of pitched me on generate and, you know, what they were doing and really found that interesting and exciting. And so I kind of started looking around, like, what's the thesis here? Like, what, what's the play um, more in the U.S. or it could be Europe as well, but in the, you know, traditional grid markets. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up spending some time, I had a lot of time with the IFC and World Bank when I was in my previous life. And so I called up my friends and colleagues everywhere, I was trying to kind of looking around, like, wh where is the, the right thesis? And uh, credit to my old friend, Eric Crabtree at the IFC, who said, you got to look at data centers, right? Everything is moving. You're in the cell tower. We call it ICT sector. Mm -hmm. I think TMT was another term they used in the World Bank. But anyway, he says, look towards data centers, right? And so I already kind of brushed into the data center sector. I had experience with fiber just because I was already in the kind of telco, you know, sector and all right. those things converge, right? So started kind of calling it digital infrastructure. That term started happening around that point. And, um, you know, ultimately where I landed after a bunch of work and really looking into data centers was there's a there's going to be a convergence or an inflection point, let's say, where um, the grid is simply unable to keep up with the power demands of the digital infrastructure sector. Right. right. At, at the end of the day, that was the thesis, like at its core that I brought to generate in hmm. 2018, 2019. Hmm. And they said that let's give you a chance. Right. <laughs> Welcome aboard. And. And, and I came on as a consultant under what they call the developer in residence program at the time. And I think that's just a, you know, a, a, maybe a position that Jigger had invented that said, hey, you're an entrepreneur, developer, and like, we don't really know what label to put on you because you're not a finance person, but, you know, can you come in and kind of try to put deals together, et cetera. And right, right, really right. ended up being, I guess, what you call an origination role that I later learned in, in finance. That's the term, right? Go out and originate deals and bring them through. Um, so again, the thesis was fundamentally on power, right? And the lack of power, let's say the lack of supply or the ability of the grid to keep up with, uh, the demand from the digital side. And, uh, yeah, I guess it was what, last year, 2022, 2023, when the AI boom took off. Right. And then suddenly the thesis was like right now, before that it was kind of in the future, let's prepare, let's think about what we can do to solve this. But um, all of a sudden the explosion happened and here we are now with, I think everyone talking about this, uh, yeah. this <laughs> power is the problem. So. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the latest, like the NVIDIA GTC announcements with Blackwell, you know, I mean, each one of those chips is, you know, peaks at about 1200 Watts. Um, yeah. and so you start to get a building full of those things, you know, and, you know, com just as a comparison, I mean, you have, um, you think about like packet core switching and things like that in sort of the telco world, you know, running on Intel, you know, Xeons and stuff, and it's all good, but it's not, uh, it's not pushing the power envelope as much as you would if you, you're stuffing that filled with, you know, NVIDIA H200s or Blackwells. I mean, that's a whole other order of magnitude, frankly, oh, yeah. more power, right? And so, and if, you know, if people who read the newspaper um, know that, you know, just public grids in general are struggling with keeping up with power, yeah. Our requirements, right, in Texas and other places and rolling brownouts. So you start adding in these data centers um, filled with AI chips, and then all of a sudden there's a gap. Maybe not all of a sudden, but I think it's kind of an obvious, you know, gap that people are trying to fill. So that that's, I think, you know, like you're, you said, it's it started out as um, uh, it's a good thesis, and now it's really becoming a reality because the demand for AI workloads is so high. Um and folks are struggling. So how are how are hyperscalers and other folks figuring this out? I mean, how are they trying to close the gap between, you know, AI factories and and uh, electricity? Yeah. So, yeah. So a few different ways. Um, 
and this was kind of core to the thesis as well. It's like, all right, there's a thesis. Great. But what's going to happen, right? As a result mm. of this, like, play this forward. And, uh, and the theory was, well, if power is so important as we know it is uh, to the growth of digital, and we're really talking about when you say hyperscalers, we're talking about the biggest of the big companies in the world, right? the biggest yeah. balance sheets, et cetera. Um, are they really going to let the grid's inability to keep up stop them from deploying? No, right? Probably I, not. I don't think so. <laughs> but my bet would be no. Right? So, uh, so the way I saw it was, well, they're going to figure out either they're going to start building their own power plants hmm. uh, or they're going to figure out how to maybe co-locate next to existing power power plants to hmm. unlock capacity uh, that might otherwise not be available due to you know transmission distribution issues or what have you. Um, right. And so I, I think that those two themes kind of come out of this. It's going to be one of one of those two. And if you really want to fast forward long term, I, I think there's a really good chance that the digital infrastructure folks are going to become energy companies themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. out of necessity right there's like a forcing function here and again we're going to bet on somebody is it going to be the you know highly innovative like largest companies in the world that's going to do that or is it going to be the mm. kind of you know the utilities um, that are going to figure out how to suddenly get super innovative and, and, and keep up both are going to happen in a way but i think my money is sure. on the big guys here in this well case. so like instead of microsoft having an xbox subsidiary that's doing gaming maybe they'll have a power subsidiary then you buy your power it's part of your M365 subscription, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think something like that is is already in the works. I mean, look at the press. Right? Mm -hmm. AWS just announced recently the deal with uh, the nuclear facility in Pennsylvania, for example. Right. Right. right? So we're, we're kind of already seeing things moving. Um, there's plenty of different uh, data centers that have adopted on-site power, like uh, Bloom Energy um, fuel cell technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. So... I think we're seeing both of those play out now in real time. It's starting to actually happen. And, mm. uh, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. Right. I think. Yeah. The, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's almost like when Apple, you know, years ago, Apple was, it got, uh, got big investments in like mining companies to get the rare metals that they needed to build iPhones and iPads. Right. They just kind of went straight to in the supply chain. And, um, you know, you're seeing some, maybe something similar like that with power and, and some of these hyperscalers. Yeah, I would. And by the way, you're talking supply chain. I would love to see them get into the transformer supply chain, right? Which <laughs> is is another major problem and bottleneck. Yeah, that's true. Now. That's the, the, the those are the um, the boxes that you see on the poles, right? That go from the yeah. basically the transmit. The down. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. It makes the voltage usable for the for the user. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And there's a whole supply chain issue around transformers. And that's one of the big shortages. I know Elon Musk has talked about that too. As, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's one thing to generate the power, then you got to move the power through the grid. And, you know, it's, maybe people don't realize this. A lot of the infrastructure that you see, especially in the U.S., is 50 or 60 years old, right? These transformers and these power lines. And there's huge inefficiency. So you may be dropping, you know, a third or more of the power by the time it goes from the, the generator, whatever it is, to, to your plug, you know, you could be losing a huge percentage of power just through those transmission lines, too, which is not right. good. That's in, a, in a world where there isn't enough power, the last thing you want to do is kind of squander it on kind of these inefficient old transmission lines, right? So that's another challenge. It's another one. There's no doubt about it, right? But again, right, who better to step in perhaps and make a difference here, uh, you know, mm. when it comes to the, the players that could do this again, we're talking about the biggest balance sheets in the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. So no, that's really point. interesting. Yeah. And so like, and you talked a little about nuclear. I mean, so typically it's interesting. The other paradox, I guess, with power is there's not enough power to power kind of the AI factory. So that's the, the working hypothesis. I think it's probably pretty well established at this point. And at the same time, there's also a move to move to more greener and renewable energy, right? Yes. So wind and solar and things like that. So you have these things are almost, I wouldn't say competing, but they are sort of both pulling in slightly different directions, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I think, again, you're going with the AWSs, the Microsofts, the Googles. That is, mm. These guys are all making really big commitments to you know, clean energy, say, right? Mm -hmm. and, I mean, yeah, definitely. G across the board and you know, 
regardless of that acronym, like they're, they're making commitments um, to a more sustainable future and mm. they have the balance sheet to, to actually do it, to, to sort of mm-hmm. push innovation forward and also you know, be the anchor customer, let's say, on you know, cleaner, more sustainable builds um, mm. for, for power plants. Right. So I think we're already aligned in that sense, right, in that yeah. they want the cleanest power. Um, however, yeah. the lack of power altogether right now kind of puts them in yeah. a conundrum too, right? Hey, if there's power available over here at this gas plant, are they going to are they going to take it or are they going to not spin up their latest data center um, and, and sort of wait yeah. for a source? I, I don't know how that's going to play out. Mm. What I can say yeah. is that where we sit, certainly, and what I represent on the generate side is we are representing for the, the cleanest sources um, right. that, that are financeable and, you know, and sustainable today. Um, right. To the degree to which we can influence the market towards more sustainable, we're going to do that. Um, mm. But I think you already largely have a, a pretty big commitment from everybody there um, to do that anyway. Right. Yeah. So I think you yeah. kind of already well aligned in that sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, the demand for power and then that turning into demand for an investments in more green power solutions is beneficial for everybody. So, and then the other trend that I've seen too, is that, you know, that used to be where you'd plop a data center, uh, an area of compute out in, you know, near a kind of a higher density population area or whatever to, to service that area. And then the power would be somewhere way out somewhere else. But now we're seeing, you mentioned like sort of almost like the co-location of compute and power generation. And yeah. so that's a different kind of, you look at a map of any country, you know, where their power stations are, you, yeah. where the power is being generated is kind of probably where the compute's going to be happening nearby, right? I mean, to, to mitigate some of these transmission issues that we were talking about. Yeah. Again, Crystal Ball would say, yes, I think that's where it's trending, right? I think that in mm-hmm. also with AI, I'm sure you know, and you've, you've talked about, right? Like the the latency is less of an issue um, than what we've traditionally thought of when it comes to the cloud, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think locationally, you still probably want to be within some reasonable driving radius of a metro area because you need the human resources, the talent to be able to yeah. get there and reasonably be able to either commute or, or live nearby. Um, but yeah, it does seem that the, the trend would be, you know, the compute is going to move to where the power is. Um, mm. more so than perhaps the power moving to the compute. Right, right. Yeah, although some days, at some point in the near future, maybe not in the near future, you'll have these kind of fuel cells attached to micro data centers, like the edge data centers, right? Where it's like a little hydrogen fuel cell stuck on the side or on the yes. top of a, a box, you know? And then, then you'll be able to sort of, that's like a microgrid architecture, right? Where you would... Yeah. Uh, you know, more, more, you know, power is more distributed to where the compute is. I mean, then that, but that's probably like five to 10 years down the road, I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes, I want to, I would think so too. But when you look at the compound annual growth estimates for edge, mm. right, it's astronomically high, <laughs> right? So you say like, if that's true, then we're going to have to figure this out pretty quickly, right? To kind of keep yeah. pace with that. Right. Because, uh, yeah, because there's now there's like there's core, there's regional, there's edge, you know, there's, you know, and then there's obviously the the the, the things, the devices, too, that are yeah. running AI. And so, you know, how to get power to where, you know, one of the, the benefits of kind of thinking around edge computing and is around, you know, doing the compute where the data is generated. Right. So like in the vehicle, on the robot, in the factory floor, in the retail shop, at the Taco Bell drive through itself. Um, and so as that trend continues to happen, like you said, the growth trend is huge there, like power needs to be there. There needs to be power there. And so I, I do think we're going to, in addition to seeing the big hyperscaler data centers with all the black wells in them, will you know, start springing up in co-location with power plants. I think we're also going to see a lot of innovation in bringing microgrid power to the edge, yeah, you know, I, to support some of these more you know, local, hyper-local, you know, power needs, right, at the same time. I agree, right? And and I think it's also important to note that those microgrids need to be able to scale up, right, mm-hmm. in as modular or in as simple, simple way as possible um, to meet the growing power demand because, again, based on what's being projected, uh, we've every reason to believe that, yes, you're going to need that initial power and then it's going to continue to grow, um, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, just to take a step back on this topic, right, what I do think is interesting and where like 
my optimism comes in as I kind of look out five, 10 years to your point on how this happens. You know, we've always talked about, I say we, us folks in the energy, clean tech sector, et cetera. We've always kind yeah. of theorized power about folks. This. Yeah, these power folks like us, right? We've theorized about this grid of the future that is going to be highly distributed, right? Mm. And it's going to be highly, um, let's call it bi directional, in that a power plant, right, can both give back power as much as it can, can consume power, et cetera. Mm. And I think data centers actually have the architecture and have the ability to be these distributed energy resources or like that, right? Mm. And when you start wrapping in what we call virtual power plants or the software, to right? Come, everything together and get these really interesting balances amongst all of these distributed resources, you could start seeing a case where the digital infrastructure sector could actually underpin the mm. build out of this distributed grid of the future, which I think is right, super right. exciting from that yeah, perspective, v- right? Right. The VPPs as they call them. And in fact, I mean, before we hit the record button, we were talking about, you have a, um, this kind of whole solar build out at the Cape at your house. Um, and I'm currently specking out adding solar there too. Um, cause the, the, for those that don't know, the new England energy market is quite expensive. And so, you know, in as much as you can generate your own power there, that's a good thing for the long term. And so then there's this thing called net metering where as you're generating power and folks that have solar know this, you know, in times when you're generating more power than you're using on your house, you're able to sell that power back to the utility right at whatever the kilowatt rate hour is usually it's whatever and so that is kind of essentially like that what bill's talking about right this is kind of like the microgrid idea is that you know power generation is could become will become hyper local to a certain extent through these renewable resources and that power can then be fed back in to a virtual power plant or some sort of system that then can then feed that power out to those that need more power than they're generating, if that makes sense. Right. So, yes. and that could be the Taco Bell drive through that's running a bunch of NVIDIA processors to look at like, uh, you know, how many tacos are in the bag or whatever the AI thing is that they need to do. And so that's, that's a really interesting development because it's sort of mixing what some people are familiar with today, which is creating their own power at their house mm-hmm. using solar panels or whatever. And then, you know, the, the, the software and the systems to sort of manage all of that is very, you know, very much in line with a lot of the uh, technology that's being developed today for data centers. Yeah, I'd take it one step further to like the solar is just think of it like a little power plant that's selling back into the grid or offsetting. Mm-hmm. Your meter. That's OK. That's like that's pretty simple when you get into the battery side or what we mm-hmm. call it microgrid solar plus storage and maybe plus a generator of some kind. Right. You have a fully grid independent system then which means it could participate in grid services programs like demand response, which is basically Mm -hmm. the grid says, hey, we need power back. You're consuming it. Can you go offline and stop drawing power from the grid? We'll pay you for that, Mm -hmm. right? And because Mm -hmm. we have an independent system, we can just rely on our battery sort of little microgrid system for as long as they need us offline. This is on a really small scale in my home, of course. It's not going to make much of a dent. But when you're talking about megawatts, gigawatts, et cetera, at the data center level, that's very meaningful and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. very helpful to the grid. Well, and like Massachusetts is incentivizing people through, you know, 0% interest loans and other things to kind of start generating their own power and selling it right. back to utility. So there's, there's a motivation there. It makes the grid more resilient. Um, it can really be a, an economic benefit to the consumer. And then, like you said, we're starting to build out more more capabilities on that. The other big part, as you mentioned, was batteries, which we haven't really talked about, but the idea of using batteries to sort of, you know, flatten out the demand curve a little bit. So, you know, if I'm generating a bunch of power, I'm not using all of it, that's stored energy somewhere, right? Could be on-prem or local. And then when there's a need, there's a store of stuff. And so, you know, traditional power plants don't operate with batteries, obviously. They just sort of generate power and Yes. You know, and if people need, and if the, the community needs more power than the plant is generating, then that's a problem. It's called like a brownout basically or whatever. Right. So, but with batteries, you can actually kind of level that off a little bit. And we're starting to see batteries being introduced, um, obviously for data centers, but you can, you know, going into these kind of edge compute situations, batteries are a really important part of that too, to help make sure that there's a good store of energy over time. Yes, I, I actually think this is where the more of like the edge AI um, compute load 
is really interesting in that, you know, there's a lot like it is it's quite beneficial to be able to participate in these grid services programs, right? Especially in ERCOT, mm -hmm. kind of famous for this, right? Where you can you can do well um, by going offline for an hour or whatever it may be, right? And and so to think that uh, these AI loads could be located in distributed basis across the U.S. and across the world, really, and be able to participate in these programs. Mm -hmm. um, like not only is that a grid positive, but from an economic perspective for the uh, yeah. for the owner, they can do quite well, right? And so that becomes really interesting in having what we call flexible load resources, right? Mm -hmm. As as part of this uh, deployment, and you know traditionally, I think it's been quite hard to get battery adoption. This is like it's still a struggle. We're not anywhere near where we would love to, where we would like to be. Um, but again, perhaps the growth in digital infrastructure is the catalyst. To actually achieve all that we've been sort of pushing for, you know, for the mm. last fifteen mm. plus years, at least in my my career so far, fifteen years. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also what's been happening too, which is helping, is I mean, if you look at going back to the Nvidia announcements on Blackwell, it's about I think about three x more power efficient than the than the Hopper um, chips. So. You know, you're. It's, of course, it's twelve hundred watts, but it's generating a lot more tops or, um, you know, teraflops, whatever. But uh, it's more AI horsepower per watt than it used to be, quite a bit. And so we're seeing a lot more improvement. And then, of course, you get into more, you know, real edge computing platforms. I mean, look at Qualcomm Snapdragon and and what Intel's doing, and then getting down to the NXPs and the STs and everyone else. They're really doing incredible amounts of horsepower with uh, very little electricity. So there's always improvements going on there too. So we're seeing power as a part of the value prop these days for AI chips, right? It's not just the horsepower, but it's the power consumption because of course some of them will be, you know, running in battery powered systems, uh, whether it's your phone or a drone or a robot or whatever. Um, but also even when they're on the grid, you know, power is an important uh, part of the value prop because, like you said, it's a scarce resource. It's an expensive resource. And I think anyone with an AI strategy also needs a power strategy. I mean, they have to be going hand in hand, right? I think that's right. And I, I mean, also, we can point to the, you say expensive, but we can point to the, you know, per kilowatt hour charges, at least we've been seeing, and, and the rise mm -hmm. in those over the years, right? Like, I don't yeah. think we're going to see a time where that really comes down materially. I think that is heading up, right? And right. if that assumption is true, uh, it also makes a really good case for some version of these microgrids as well. Um, a lot of them already pencil in high power, par uh, high power price markets, like in yeah. California, like in much of the Northeast, PJM territory, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? These are penciling out, whereas, you know, a handful of years ago, they didn't pencil as compared to the grid. So, so now you actually have an opportunity where not only is this more resilient and providing all of the benefits that we just discussed, but it's also less expensive and mm. can be at a fixed price. So we're right. not going to see this, the, the escalation you might expect from the traditional. True. Yeah. And at first, you know, going back to solar, I mean, the panels are more efficient than they used to be and all that other stuff. So now it's a combination of efficiency of the tech and uh, unfortunately the cost of the power are now, you know, meeting at a point where, it kind of makes a lot of sense to, to, to get more into these microgrids and thinking about that. So that, that's, yeah, that's part of the equation. Then we also talked about just that, you know, the big power stories for some of these hyperscalers and how they're solving that by, you know, leaning into energy resources, let's put it that way. And we'll see how far they lean, lean in, yes. uh, but they're going to need to, you know, we know the hyperscalers have whole organizations dedicated to power planning and, you know, all this other stuff, right? Because it's a big deal. It's it's uh, it's non-trivial stuff. So it'll be really interesting to see how all this stuff plays out over the next five, 10 years. I think if people are looking for, you know, career opportunities, I think the power space is always, <laughs> it seems like there's a yeah. lot of work to do there, right? Especially where so. it intersects with digital, right? I mean, I yeah. think that's Incredible. the equation. Um, Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, Bill, it's great having you on the show. Um, and, you know, I do, I have it in my to-do list to go check out your solar, your solar setup at your house. Yes. Uh, I, I would state also, of the art. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I would also say just to the edge side, right? I mean, to, to all of it. Um, as you know, Ubiquity is a, is a platform company and generates, mm -hmm. right? it's focused traditionally on fiber, but it's really digital infrastructure. They're now in the edge data center business. But mm -hmm. we look at that business and 
um, and we think about what's the value proposition to the market, right? What we're kind of landing on is you need to be able to provide not just an edge, a hosted edge data center, right? You need to be able to provide the edge data center with the power capacity, yeah. right? At, at a given price, like that whole package has to be together. And I think yeah. that the industry, the sector, the developers, and the, the the companies that are focusing on working on this problem need that as a takeaway. You need to have both. It cannot just be, hey, I have a great edge data center pod here. It has to be, what's the total solution? Can you deliver me, yeah. you know, X megawatts in right. less than 24 months or less than 36 yeah. months, right? Ready to go at this power price. And mm. this is really where Ubiquity in its edge business anyway is spending a lot mm -hmm. of time. So how do we deliver that full package, right? Yeah. But I would say that's the whole sector needs to be thinking along yeah. those lines. Yeah. Well, kind of going back to the Brad Smith thing I mentioned at the start is like, you know, what, the two fundamental parts of the AI economy are power and connectivity, and they need to be thought of together. That's so right. you can't obviously have one without the other and still have a business, but uh, yeah, cool. Well, Bill, again, thanks. Thanks a lot for joining us. And um, you know, we, we're at the end of another podcast. So uh, hopefully it. folks learned a little bit and uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today on the Edge Celsior Show. Please subscribe and stay tuned for more and check us out online about how you can scale your edge compute business.